Welcome friends, today we will learn something on QRA which is focus on FEMA. We are talking about module 1 safety assurance and assessment lecture 13 failure mode and effect analysis. I will take up an example of solving a design FMEA in this class today for make you to understand how easily an FMEA report can be generated for a new kind of design problem. We already know that FMEA is one of the effective quantitative risk analysis tool which can be applied to study the failure modes of newly designed product or newly activated process in a given system. Essentially this can be applied to mechanical or electrical systems. It works intricately at the interior details of the component level of analysis and then ultimately the consequence of failure of different components are diagnosed then the sequence of failure is also rated what we call as risk priority number. In the last example we saw how FMEA can be applied to a newly designed developed mechanical wave energy converter which was developed at Oceaning Department IIT Madras. In this example again we will show you a newly developed deep water offshore platform where it was designed, developed and conceptualized again at IIT Madras Oceaning Department. We will see how a failure mode effect analysis can be done for a new product development as you see in this example. I am talking about design FMEA in this particular lecture. We all know that FMEA is an alternate method of hazard identification. We have understood that in a given process problem identifying hazard is one of the major tasks especially when the process takes place at different operational temperature and pressure it becomes difficult to really preamble the failure or hazardous nature of any process operations. FMEA actually considers possible outcomes of all failure modes or deviations. We already know in any qualitative risk analysis we have two set of arguments one is what is called as the design intent of the given system and other is the deviations of the design intent that the design intent is not made functional completely which can result in consequence. So, we also know in ASAP report which is one of the qualitative risk analysis tool we already know the primary keywords which are associated with the design intents and the secondary keywords that are associated with the deviations are very useful in expressing qualitatively the risk involved in a given system. It also gives me the recommendations and consequence of analysis etcetera. Therefore, one can easily know what is the potential hazard present in a process plant. Similarly, we are trying to understand how FMEA can also be used as one of the quantitative risk tools for risk analysis in mechanical in electrical systems. So, if you have got any new system in place the fundamental request to understand the failure will be what will be the possible outcome if the failure modes in a system are activated or if the components are deviated from the design intent. So, FMEA essentially focus on failure modes identification and the consequences and more importantly the sequence of failure. This is most suitable to complex mechanical and electrical systems because complex systems which are newly developed product or newly identified process in a given scheme becomes difficult to perceive an hazard therefore, we look into component levels of analysis in a given complex mechanical or electrical system and FME is one of the very powerful tool as we already said to do an FME analysis it does not require a standard or a prescribed qualification. It requires good experience and good perseverance of hazard present in a given system. Most importantly as I told you in the last lecture to do an FMEA you must at least have a working scaled model or a prototype of the given system based on the working conditions only FMEA can be conceptualized. FMEA is not an ideal solution it is actually a perseverance of hazard when the model or the prototype is in operable conditions. Therefore, FMEA is relatively of a high importance in a given mechanical electrical system because you put the system in operation and try to perceive the hazard cost because of the operational conditions. FMEA does not only focus on the mechanical deviations of the component it focus on 
the deviation of the component under operation. So, it is very important for a process industry in particular like oil and gas industry to understand how risk analysis can be quantified using an FME analysis. It can be applied at different levels of complexity which we discussed in the last lecture. In this present class, we will talk about a new design FMEA problem as applied to a newly deep water development platform which is offshore triceratops. As we already explained to you, when you want to do a risk analysis, you must first understand either the system or the process in detail. In last example class, we expressed you how to understand the working of a group gathering station. Therefore, you were made comfortable to prepare or to write an ASAP report for a group gathering station because you have been told briefly how the chemical process happens in a group gathering station. Similarly, in this example, if you are attempting to do an FMEA for a new structural system like an offshore stricer or top, it is essential for us to first understand a brief view about triceratops. Let us quickly talk about offshore triceratops. When we <coughs> say that there are very different types of structures available for deep water oil exploration starting from tension like platform, gravity based semi submersible platforms, spars, FPSOs, buoyant like structures, triceratops, mini docks and circular FPSOs. These are different kinds of structural forms which are essentially available as on present date for deep water and ultra deep water oil and gas exploration. If you try to list them in the literature, what are the different kinds of structural forms available for deep water and ultra deep water oil and gas exploration, you will see that tension neck platforms abbreviated as TLPs, spar platforms, semi submersibles, floating, production, storage and offloading what we briefly call as FPSOs, buoyant like structures and of course, triceratops are available in the literature or indicated in the literature as one of the most successful conceptualized structural forms which can be used or which can be deployed for oil and gas exploration in deep and ultra deep waters. So, triceratop is one of the kind of offshore platform which is conceived on a new novel geometry which is essentially applicable to deep and ultra deep waters for oil and gas exploration and production. It is relatively a new concept. Since it is a new concept, the viewers must understand the structural form of this particular problem, the experimental investigation applied on this problem to understand what are the components in a given design of an FMEA. The picture on the slide now shows a conceptual view of an offshore triceratop. Let us quickly see what are the components which are vital, which contribute to the assembly of a triceratop. As we all understand, the top side which consists of a deck which houses all necessary top side facilities that are required for oil gas exploration and production and of course, partly the processing. For example, you can see a flare boom, you can see a crane, you can see a drilling derrick living quarters all these are common topside facilities which are generally provided in all platforms that are meant for deep water oil exploration and production. Now, the deck is connected to the bottom structural form. The bottom structural form is what we call as buoyant leg structure which is abbreviated as BLS. The effective characteristics of buoyant leg structure are the following it is a positive buoyant system. The moment I say it is a positive buoyant system, please understand technically that the stability of these platforms are much larger and safe compared to that of other kinds of platforms. Buoyant leg structure essentially resembles a spar because you know spar is actually a cylindrical type of a mono hull which is housed or circumscribed by other cell spars. You can see that this more or less resembles a spar due to a deep draft configuration. However, if you look at the motions of buoyant leg structure, they are similar to that of a tension leg platform. So, one can say that buoyant leg structure is an hybrid combination of two classical deep water structural systems namely spar and a TLP. Now, these buoyant leg structures are connected to the deck 
using a special kind of arrangement what we call as a ball joint. Now, the ball joint is placed between the buoyant lug structures and the deck. Now, interestingly this ball joint is a special characteristic. It is capable of transferring only the translational motion, but no rotation about any axis. Now, one can ask me a question what would be a classical advantage of having a ball joint which is separated or which is connecting the buoyant lug structure to that of a deck. Now, when the ball joint does not allow rotation to pass or transfer from the substructure to that of a superstructure or from that of a superstructure to that of a substructure, it perceives lot of advantages. The primary advantage is say for example, because the drilling derrick or because of the living quarters, it attracts lot of aerodynamic eccentric loading on the deck. Now, imagine that if the deck is connected to the buoyant lift structure by a rigid mode of connectivity, the pitch, roll and yaw motions which are essentially rotational by nature will be transferred to the top of the buoyant lift structure from the aerodynamic response of the deck. On the other hand, if the buoyant lift structures are subjected to lateral load from hydrodynamic wave action, now they will also have all these kind of motion which are essentially rotational. Now, they will be also transferred to the deck. Now, the deck will experience lot of rotational motion which is a very common problem in TLP and the toughest part which is now filtered because the ball joint does not allow transfer of rotation from the substructure to that of the superstructure. So, on the other hand if a hinged joint is placed here like a ball joint if the buoyant lift structure moves or oscillates or rotates or pitch or roll action or involved in buoyant lift structure this will not be transferred to the deck. Therefore, the deck is supposed to remain horizontal even under severe lateral actions or forces exercised by the buoyant lift structure. So, that enables a smooth production and activity on the top side of such platforms. So, it is a new conceived idea which is conceptualized by White et al in 2005 which is now conceptualized as experimental and numerical investigation at IIT Madras which is now patented to IIT Madras. The ball joint is essentially an important feature of this specific platform. Now, the buoyant lug structure with a deep draft element has got to be also connected to the seabed. Now, the connection of the buoyant lug structure to the seabed is happening through the restraining system which can be either tethers or restraining legs. Let us quickly see what are the salient advantages of this kind of a structural form. It enables better motion characteristics, therefore it is found to be suitable for deep waters. It has got improved dynamic characteristics in comparison to TLP and SPA. I am making this statement because I will show you subsequently lot of results which are experimentally investigated in our laboratory. Therefore, you will realize and understand and partly agree with me that the structural dynamic characteristics of this kind of platform is far superior in comparison to TLP and the SPAR. Of course, you can always refer to lot of literature and papers available in the open domain which can classify the advantages and compare the advantages with that of new structural form of offshore triceratops compared to that of any similar deep water offshore platforms like TLP and SPAR. One other advantage what people conceive in this kind of geometry is that the drilling wells are within the protected environment and therefore, they are laterally supported. Therefore, the drilling wells are not subjected to eccentric lateral loading which is one of the important reason for hazardous situation that occur in other drilling platforms in offshore structures. It has got almost a simple station keeping characteristic which makes it easy to install and decommission whenever it is required. Most importantly the whole topside facility can become reusable and which can be also relocated which is now considered to be one of the major advantages of new structural form which are evolved for deep water and ultra deep water explorations. It has got a very simple restraining system 
as compared to that of TLP. On the other hand, the pretension invoked in these tethers are far lesser than that of a TLP. Therefore, the fatigue loading insisted or cost on the tethers because of reversal of loading are almost limited in case of a tricer or top. The structure is considered to be highly stable because it is positively buoyant and most importantly the operational and successful maintenance is comparatively low. However, the capex cost the initial investment in, in installing this platform is slightly on the relatively higher side compared to that of any other conventional platforms. Let us now quickly see what are the motion characteristics of a buoyant leg structure alone. A buoyant leg structure has got essentially 6 degrees of freedom as any floating body has. Surge, sway and heave are the translational motions. Roll, pitch and yaw are the rotational motions with respect to any specific degrees of freedom namely x axis, y and z axis respectively. The buoyant leg structure which is a deep trapped element which will be anchored to the seabed using a tethered leg or a restrained leg. We also investigated scaled models of triceratop at a payload capacity of about 14,846 tons. Essentially this is totaled because this is the one which is required for production and drilling platform in a classical type of TLP or a SPA. Now the picture shows a fabricated buoyant leg structure alone. This is the fabricated ball joint what you see here which connects the buoyant leg structure to that of the deck. The installation of the buoyant leg structure and the deck are isolated. The BLS is first installed using a tether restraining system and subsequently the ball joint connects the deck to the BLS. So, a tripod arrangement of three sets of BLS are conceived in this platform geometry and the top deck is of a rectangular in shape as you see here. Now, the deck is connected to the ball joint and the ball joint is connecting subsequently the BLS to that of the deck through the ball joint. If you look at the details or the structural characteristics of triceratop, it has got a drilling system, it has got other parallel systems required for drilling, it has got an allowance in the load on the top side and the material essentially is of a steel and the total mass of the top side is about 14,846 tons which is modeled as about 39.1 kg in the given experimental investigation. Similarly, for the buoyant leg structure we have also classified the weight or the mass appearing from different systems and you will see that even the pretension and the tethered mass is also scaled down in the experimental study. If you look at the particulars of the deck and the tethers which is of a scaled model of 1 is to 72.4 to house the requirements what we have in the laboratory at Ocean Department IIT Madras. So, the scale factor plays a very important role in conceptualizing the movement or the motion characteristics from that of a model to that of a prototype. So, we have modeled including as minor details as axial stiffness of the member and area of the tethers as close as possible to that of the reality. Now, we also perform center of gravity test to ensure that the buoyant leg structure remains positive buoyant and it can be installed independent of that of the deck. So, these are the three buoyant structures assembled together which are connected integrated by stiffeners at every equal distance as this is the ball joint that is going to be the connectivity at the bottom. This is a top side detail the arrangement which is now interested to invoke the later loading on the aerodynamic part of the superstructure. There are different methods by which a triceratop can be installed. You can see here this image or this photograph shows the buoyant structure installed in a triangular form with that of the tethers held whereas the deck is not placed in position. So, according to AP RP2T installation methods of TLP are the following. You can install them by a ballast method, you can install them by a pull down method, you can install them by a combination of ballast and pull down method. SPA generally is installed by a free floating concept. As I said triceratop is a combination of hybrid combination of SPA and TLP. We install triceratop by combining the methods of TLP and SPA. So, therefore, installation is done 
part by part of a tracer atop which is very very advantageous compared to any other classical installation procedures of offshore platforms. We also perform hydrodynamic studies of free floating BLS to maintain and ensure its stability while it is free floating. The details are given for the model 2 what you see in the screen now. We can see here the KM and the GM the metacentric height clearly indicates that the system remains positive buoyant for a given scale ratio. It is interesting for us to know what would be the structural characteristics of the ball joint under the combination of PM interaction. P is the axial force applied from the deck to the BLS through the ball joint and M is nothing but the activity of rotation of transfer which is restrained by the ball joint from the top of the top side to the top of the BLS. Therefore, we also conducted the PM interaction study or M phi curve is plotted, force is applied near the joint, the force is measured using ring type load cell, rotation response in the ball joint is measured using inclinometer, the moment required for unit rotation is evaluated and damping in the joint was evaluated also using a free oscillation curve as from the results of experimental studies. Once we understand the concepts and the components of a new structural form which we call as offshore tracer on top, let us now get back to the risk analysis of tracer on top as a design conceptualization. As we just now saw offshore tracer on top has got two major components, one is called the substructure, other is the deck structure. The substructure consists of the ball joint, BLS or the buoyant deck structures and the teeth as well as the deck structure consists of dual string, risers, derrick and an LNG tank for processing or storage. Now, let us quickly see what are the different failure modes that can be identified instantaneously when you talk about design FMEA of an offshore tracer or top. These are the common failure modes by which the members or the components of tracer or top can fail fatigue, bending, torsion, corrosion, snapping, collapse and buckling. Now, let us try to see which are all these components which can be integrated or perceived to have this kind of failure. Let us take for example, a ball joint. Ball joint can fail by fatigue because it is having reversal of forces and reversal of directions and rotation. Ball joint can also fail because of corrosion. Ball joint is unable to fail because of bending because it is a constant interaction of bending and rotation. Similarly, if you look at tethers, it can fail by fatigue can fail by corrosion, can fail by snapping because teeth those are subjected to high initial preaxial tension. If the tension is relaxed during installation, the teeth those can get snapped and that is the problem. If you talk about LNG tankers because of the hoopsters involved and because of the dimensions involved, they can fail either by corrosion, they can fail by buckling as well. So, one can easily identify now the different modes of failure and connect these modes of failure respectively to different components of a given conceived new concept of design which is offshore tracer auto. Now, what could be the causes of this failure? It can be insufficient strength which is arising from material degradation. It can be also an error in the design and fabrication, installation and operation. On the other hand, causes of failure can also be due to excessive load that arise from environment during operation or installation and of course, you cannot avoid accidental load in a given structural system like offshore tracer or tops. So, what we do here is we do cause failure analysis quickly for a given conceptual design of offshore tracer or top. We identify the subsystems and super system, we identify the components in the structure, we identify the failure modes and subsequently we identify the causes for such failures. Once we have this data on our hand, we can now quickly do an FMEA. Before that, let us see what are the different steps what you have got to conceive in an FMEA as a brief summary. One should identify the operating step in a given problem. One should also know what is the potential or the hazard present in the given problem and the reasons for the hazard and what would be the result of the hazard meaning in a given problem. Can it be possible to detect the hazard in advantage, in advantage to that of the system? So, once we have this, 
let us also quickly see what would be the safety measure available in a given system. Then we suggest improvements and reevaluate all these parts to make an FMEA. Now to make an FMEA we are going to convert the qualitative understanding of the failure mode to a quantified number because risk is nothing but a quantification of failure. Now to do that we have got three concepts or three parameters detection, occurrence and severity. We already said in the last example they are worked out on a 10 point scale. Let us quickly see what is the detection rating scale. Detection rating scale varies from 1 to 10 where 1 stands for the detection of failure is almost certain whereas 10 says it is absolutely uncertain you will never know that the failure can happen instantaneously. It means the detection of failure is uncertain but if you have a mechanism or a sensor or a record or a wall or a pressure transmitter which can indicate the failure in advance which can anticipate the failure in advance then the detectability of failure is higher therefore one can say the detectability is almost certain. On the other hand the defect is obvious or there is 100 percent automatic inspection available in the given system which can detect this failure much in advance whereas on the other hand the component is never inspected or the defect cannot be identified because it goes unidentified even in the design stage itself. So, one can give any scalar value quantitatively for a number varying from 1 to 10 for detectability of failure. The second parameter which is most important in working out the FMEA study is severity rating scale. The severity rating scale also appears from a scale of 1 to 10 where 1 says no severity at all whereas 10 says it is dangerously high. So, the moment we say dangerously high then we say that the failure could injure the customer or an employee or it can cause an economic loss to the platform. So, one should identify what would be the severity if a component fails. So, if the component fails the severity can be classified in all these 10 columns so that you can give a relative number. So, what we are trying to do here in this table is we are converting the qualitative observations of the behavior of the platform during experiments or during investigations to that of an equivalent quantified number. So, FMEA quantifies risk of course, the risk is estimated on a qualitative scale. So, this is a bridge between the qualitative statements or observations of the experimental study to that of a quantified number because risk is of course, in a quantified number. The third important parameter is occurrence rating scale which is also varying from 1 to 10. 1 means the occurrence is remote, failure is most unlikely whereas 10 the occurrence is very high, failure is almost inevitable. So, one can easily find out what would be the occurrence of failure by comparing the probability of occurrence of the failure by having experience of similar failures in the recent past. Once we understand that how we can quantify these numbers in a scale of 1 to 10, the maximum score of RPN can be 1000 because 10 of each and RPN which is called risk priority number is a product of occurrence, severity and detectability. Therefore, on a 10 point scale you can have a maximum value of 1000 for an RPN. Now, let us quickly see this table which is an FME outcome of the study what we have done. Let us say the part of the process name is offshore triceratop is a design FMEA, it is on the experimental stage, model data is experimentally investigated, design responsibility is with ISXXX company. The other areas involved in the design or design and development stage of the platform, the engineering change level is only on the preliminary design stage. Let us look at various components involved and their functions and their failure modes and their effects which we just now saw about two slides early. Ball joint can have a function of supporting the deck and the weight, it connects BLS to the deck. The failure mode of ball joint can be because of fatigue or because of corrosion in the environment of ocean. The consequences or the effects of the failure can be excessive topside moments, it can result in collapse of the deck. Therefore, the severity associated with this kind of problem is very high therefore, a point of 10 is indicated here. Now, the occurrence of this failure 
can be on a point of 5 which is moderate and if you look at the causes for this failure one important cause can be a faulty design of the ball joint. If you correct the faulty design of the ball joint let us say the occurrence of failure is brought down from a number of 5 to 1. Now how to do this? The controls inspected will be routine inspection. Keep on inspecting the ball joint and keep on replacing it as the ball joint gets corroded or gets stuck with that of the moment imposed on the ball joint. Therefore, the detectability is almost on a scale of 1 because ball joint is above water you can always periodically inspect it. Now, the modified values of severity and occurrence and that of detection gives me a scale of 10 which gives me an RPN of 10. So, please understand it is not the product of 10 into 5 into 1, it is 10 into 1 into 1. Why this occurrence is taken? Because the potential reasons for failure are identified and rigorous testing is done as a recommendation. Therefore, faulty design of ball joint can be avoided. Therefore, the risk priority number which gives me the sequence of failure of the components is now 10. Similarly, look at the buoyant legs which provides buoyancy. It can fail by bending, torsion and corrosion. If it fails, it will cause instability overturning and submergence to the platform. Therefore, the severity is very high and the occurrence also very high. However, if you avoid the design error by ultrasonic welding and proper inspection, then the detection can be 5 and however, the occurrence of failure cannot be brought down from 8 to any other scale as a subjective value. Therefore, now the risk priority number goes very high because it is 64 that is 8 into this 8. 64 of detection is 5, I get a risk priority number of very, very high value. So, if you look at the other components like teethers, drilling string, risers, derrick and LNG tank, the functions, various failure modes and their consequences are already addressed about two slides early. Please look at them. However, if the leakage and explosion is involved in LNG tank, the severity of failure is on a very high catastrophic scale. If it results only in oil spill or a plant shutdown, it is not as serious as this, then we put it on a 5 point scale and so on. Most of the potential reasons which are envisaged after conducting experimental analysis for this particular problem is faulty design, design error, operational problems during installation. If you want to take care of this, the occurrence of this can be brought down from a higher scale to a lower scale. Friends, please know that the occurrence should not be increased from the previous scale except for a specific reason. Now, see why the occurrence in this case is higher because though we have environmental factors which can contribute, the drill string goes unnoticed even though you have periodic inspections. So, therefore, the occurrence of failure arise from drill string can be higher which can result in adherence of safety standards or which can be controlled by adherence of safety standards. Therefore, if you look at the last column here with the risk priority number, this gives me the sequence of failure of all the components involved in a conceived design of offshore tracer or tops. So, the most vulnerable component in a given system has been identified as buoyant leg structure because it is having the highest priority number. Followed by which LNG tank, the reason being if the LNG tank is subjected to a failure mode as expected here, it results in explosion which can be a catastrophic failure. Therefore, one can carefully see how the RPN quantifies the sequence of failure of the components and FMEA is a very interesting tool which can be applied to understand how the conceived design can be also augmented for the failure criteria. So, friends in this example, we have already seen how we can conceptually understand different failure modes of a newly conceived design. I have given a brief overview to you about a newly developed platform which is offshore triceratop which is conceived and developed, designed and patented at IIT Madras at Oceanic Department. Do you have any questions to me? Please post it at Inpeter. Thank you very much.